Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, thanks for joining us for this presentation by Dr. Francis Levine today on Reflections of the Santa Fe Trail. I'm Melanie McCorder, the Development Coordinator for Historic Santa Fe Foundation. Historic Santa Fe Foundation, for those of you who don't know, we're located in Santa Fe, New Mexico on Historic Canyon Road. The offices, sala, and gardens are now open Monday through Friday, and we currently are requiring masks. If you want to find out more about us, you can go to historicsantafe.org. We're working on a schedule of salons for 2020, so we hope to have more exciting events like this one. We are a member-based organization. Many of you are joining today as members and didn't pay any admission to join for that, and that's one of the perks and benefits of being a member of the, of the foundation. And we do have an upcoming performance. It's an in-person performance. So for those of you who can make it, we do have a few limited spots left. It's gonna be at San Miguel Chapel with Rob Martinez, the New Mexico State historian, who's also a musician. So he's going to perform um, Hispanic music for our audience. And that will be December 13th at 5.30. Once again, you can find out at historicsantafe.org under the events if you'd like to sign up for that event too. And you're welcome to contact us too if you do have questions. We are hosting an, uh, our former artist in residence, Sarah Stark and Jack Stark Dudzak as our December exib exhibition in the Sala here at El Zaguan that opens next Friday, December 10th from five to seven. You can find that once again on the events page. Today, uh, your, the participants will be joining us without video and audio. So we do encourage questions though for after the talk, we have reserved some room for that. If you would like to post questions, please do so in the chat or the q and I'll check both of those. So they're the fields that are at the bottom of your Zoom links. And I'll read them out to Dr. Levine and she'll respond to him at that point. We do keep the audio and video out all for the presentation. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the speaker for those of you who don't know. Dr. Francis Levine became the president and CEO of the Missouri Historical Society and the uh, Missouri History Museum in the spring of 2014. Under her leadership in 2017, MHS received the first ever award for diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion given by the American Alliance of Museums. Two years later, Dr. Levine led a successful reaccreditation of the Missouri Historical Society by AMA, as well as a successful integration of the Soldiers Memorial Military Museum into the institutional organization of the Missouri Historical Society. She has been honored with various civic and business awards, including being named as one of the most influential women in business by the St. Louis Business Journal, receiving a National Urban League Salute to Women in Leadership Award, and the Norman A. Stack Community Relations Award for, uh, from the Jewish Community Relations Council in St. Louis. A native of Connecticut, Dr. Levine received her BA in Anthropology from the University of Colorado Boulder, and her MA and PhD in Anthropology from Southern Methodist University in Dallas. In 2019, she attended the prestigious Getty Museum Leadership Institute. Dr. Levine has been an author, co-editor, and contributor to various award-winning books, and she has just completed a manuscript for the University of Kansas Press entitled Crossings, Women on the Santa Fe Trail. It'll be published in 2022, so we'll be delighted to see when that comes out. So now I'd like to welcome Dr. Levine. Thanks, Fran. Thank you so much, Melanie. I hope I'm unmuted. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little disconcerting not to see you. You know, it's a little bit like doing radio and television. I just have to, you know, yeah. have, to have faith well, I, that there's an I audience. The video there. popped up, but we'll see. If not, then I'll just be a voice floating in the abyss. But yeah, thank you for joining us. Well, thank now, you so much. I wish I were there in person, although I have to say, that today in St. Louis, it's 73 degrees on December 3rd, which is just crazy. Wow. And uh, th there's a fairly bright blue sky. So it's, um, it's warmer here than Santa Fe, which is not always the case. And I'm very happy to be joining you to talk about this subject. I um, was recently in Santa Fe. Um, oops, 
Melanie, my slideshow is not advancing. Let me try this. There we go. I was recently in Santa Fe and elsewhere on the Santa Fe Trail celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Santa Fe Trail. But I kept asking myself, what exactly were we celebrating? So on the left is a sculpture that's in Overland Park, Kansas, just outside of Kansas City of this wagon train with the men on horseback and uh, the oxen pulling these freight wagons and the women, women and children walking alongside the walking alongside the wagon, a very common image of the Santa Fe Trail. And then a few days later, I was uh, both in Las Vegas and Santa Fe, and I was in Santa Fe for the reenactment of William Becknell's um, entrance into Santa Fe and his welcome at the Palace of the Governors by Gun Governor Facundo Malgares. It was really interesting to me to look at these two images and think about the image of the Santa Fe Trail. Um, you know, I think one of the things that the reenactment in Santa Fe was very careful to do was to not depict uh, Becknell as a kind of mountain man or an adventurer, but as a merchant. Well, he was a merchant, but he was also more. He was a, uh, he was a, uh, a salt miner, a salt processor in Boone's Lick, uh, Missouri, just west of St. Louis. And he was also a debtor, which is what took him on the road to Santa Fe. Robert Knott wrote a wonderful uh, series of articles in the New Mexican. Uh, Dave Kendall, who's a major uh, producer of documentaries in um, Missouri and Kansas, uh, Kansas City. Now, Kansas City is both Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas. So we claim KC Public Television in both states. It's really housed in Kansas, but it's claimed in both states. And um, so we were doing a lot of investigation along the trail uh, in the five states. You know that that the Santa Fe Trail crosses uh, begins in Missouri, and I will argue a very different starting point. Uh, not in Arrow Rock, but in St. Louis. So it begins in St. Louis. The majority of the Santa Fe Trail, about 85% of the Santa Fe Trail is in Kansas, crosses into Oklahoma for a short distance, up into Colorado, down into New Mexico. And of course it misses Texas and Texas was very jealous of that uh, omission. Um, but I have been studying the Santa Fe Trail a long, long time. And several for several years, Tom Merlin and I taught summer field schools and elder hostels on the Santa Fe Trail. And we visited various points along the trail in New Mexico, uh, Wagon Mound, where we used to actually walk in the ruts of the trail uh, and look back at that beautiful skyline. And when people, were traveling the Santa Fe Trail when they saw the skyline at Wagon Mound, and which they could see in the distance, they were already feeling like they were getting close, uh, close to the end of their journey. When they entered Fort Union, um, they were in the protection of uh, the U.S. much more, much more, um, uh, much more present uh, in their in the the end of their trail journey. So I've been studying the Santa Fe Trail a long time. I started being interested in the Santa Fe Trail when I worked as an archeologist in Santa Fe. And I remember working on an archeological site out near um, La Cienaguilla, New Mexico, and finding pieces of blue and white transfer ware ceramics and what we called mocha ware ceramics and banded ceramics uh, and a real change from Native American ceramics. And I was so excited because I could see and feel tangibly the impact of the Santa Fe Trail in the material culture of New Mexico. But when I moved to Missouri, I found myself with a very different series of questions and perspectives on the Santa Fe Trail. I'm hoping it'll stay now. Um, this is a, a real standard image of the Santa Fe Trail that you often find in restaurants, in museums, all across the Santa Fe Trail. And it shows the trail starting 
in Old Franklin, Missouri, or Boone's, Boonesville or Boone's Lick. Uh, you find the beginning is claimed at Arrow Rock. Some people say it starts in Independence. Um, and where does it end? It ends either in Santa Fe um, or it ends in Taos. But I think that somebody who is a Santa Fe Trail uh, aficionado who lives in Arrow Rock, New Mexico said to me, you know, the Santa Fe Trail started where you started and ended where you ended. Not terribly profound, but absolutely true. Well, when I got here in St. Louis, I was anxious to get out on the Santa Fe Trail. And so almost every Friday or Saturday, I would get in the car and drive somewhere looking for the Santa Fe Trail. And I went to Arrow Rock and I went to Old Franklin, which are often called the beginning of the Santa Fe Trail. Old Franklin right now is um, really nothing but a floodplain with a Santa Fe Trail marker on it. And um, not even any trail runs. When you go to Arrow Rock and Old Franklin, you are confronted with, yes, a lot of monuments to the Santa Fe Trail. But I kept saying, how could it have started there? What brought it there? So I changed my tactics and came back to the area around St. Louis, which is often not included in descriptions of the Santa Fe Trail. But right there on the, um, on the waterfront in St. Louis, you can't avoid the understanding that the Santa Fe Trail begins closer to St. Louis. The image on the left is an 1858 illustration from the Illustrated London News. And that's Broadway in St. Louis. And that Broadway is where there were major wagon makers, major suppliers, uh, major um, shipping ports. And without the Santa Fe Trail, without the shipping and, um, and uh, industries of St. Louis, I maintain that there would be no Santa Fe Trail, that there would not be. Santa Fe Trail begins on the banks of the Mississippi and the Missouri River. On the right, you see the illustration of the steamship Arabia. And the steamship Arabia sank um, it, at, um, uh, sank at the um, bend of the Missouri River that was called, um, oh my goodness, I have lost the name of the name of the bend, but um, the Ondante Bend of the Missouri River. And that bend in the river, that steamboat sank in 18, in September of 1856. In 1988, archeologists and, um, and salvage seekers found the remains of the steamship Arabia in a cornfield um, near, uh, near um, Kansas City, Missouri. You can visit the museum of the steamship Arabia and what's in that steamship are pottery and tools and uh, bottled goods, foodstuffs, jewelry, shoes, everything that was manufactured in a very wide area of the Midwest and the Eastern United States. In fact, you could say that the banks of the Mississippi River were, and the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri were kind of the commercial heart of the United States. And it was that gathering of materials on the banks of the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers, the confluence area that fed the wagons and fed the boats that, um, that then were carried across to St. Louis. Now, uh, to Santa Fe, excuse me. It's very, very, it's a true statement that St. Louis is not on the Santa Fe Trail um, uh, on the Overland Trail, but without the goods and the wagons that were manufactured, many of the wagons that were used on the Santa Fe Trail 
were made by wagon makers in St. Louis. You've heard of the Johnson wagons, the, um, the looting house wagons, and all of those were manufactured in St. Louis. So it's that intersection, that, that, um, that gathering of goods that fed the Santa Fe Trail. These are two photographs that I really like to show in concert. Um, the photograph of the steam of the um, uh, of the uh, steamboats is obviously the St. Louis. Those are the steamships that first began steam um, boats that began to serve St. Louis in 1817, and the banks of the Mississippi River. This picture was taken in 1853. That was after a major reconstruction of the waterfront in St. Louis. The waterfront in St. Louis burned, most of St. Louis burned in 1849. But by 1853, when this daguerreotype was made by Thomas Easterly, the waterfront was once again serving the Santa Fe Trail and serving the rebuilding um, of St. Louis. The image on the right is an 1867 photograph of the Palace of the Governors and Santa Fe Plaza. Now that's one of the very earliest pictures of Santa Fe that comes from the photo archives at the Palace of the Governors. And that photograph shows some the Ellsberg and Anberg uh, trains that came down the Santa Fe Trail bringing goods from St. Louis and the Midwest into Santa Fe. Now Santa Fe itself was a little too small. The trade started on the Santa Fe Trail for sure in, 18, um, in 1821 when, when um, William Becknell made his, his entrada into Santa Fe. Um, and Becknell himself was not the first person to try to trade on the Santa Fe Trail. In fact, beginning when St. Louis was settled in 1764, there had already been a great deal of trade between Missouri and the Rocky Mountains. Furs and fur traders, uh, Comanches, Kiowas, Osage, Missouri Indians, um, Pawnees had been carrying trade goods back and forth across the heartland of the US of the continent. Um, and so I think when we look at when the Santa Fe Trail begins and we start it in 1821, we really truncate a much longer period of trade. Um, I have been working on several different stories of traders who traded between Missouri and New Mexico um, well before 1821. In fact, in St. Louis, I live in a neighborhood called Demun, and Jules Demun traded between Santa Fe and St. Louis starting in about 1817. And he tried to establish trade. He did about three, um, three um, expeditions between Santa Fe and St. Louis carrying furs and hides. And he was arrested on his last trip uh, in 1817. I think I said he started in 1817. I believe he started in 1814. So when we start the commemoration in 1821, we really leave off a very significant part of the story of, this, of trade uh, and interregional trade. Santa Fe wasn't really large enough to sustain the profitability of the Santa Fe Trail. And so the Santa Fe Trail and Santa Fe Plaza become a nexus. It's really a nexus between the frontier of Mexico and the frontier of the United States. By about 1839, the major trade is really between Missouri Santa, and Santa Fe and then between Santa Fe and Mexico. Uh, deep into the interior of Mexico. I love this photograph of um, the Camino Real. Whenever I drive from Santa Fe to Albuquerque, I look for this notch uh, 
in the in the roadside and think about the trade that not only went north and south from from Mexico City to Santa Fe, but also the trade that went east and west from Santa Fe back to Missouri. So when we start in 1821, we leave off a very significant part of the discussion of New Mexico, New Mexicans who were involved in the trade. And when we talk about 1821, we're also really leaving out uh, we, we tend to talk about the Americans who were part of the trade. Sorry, I don't know why it keeps jumping like that. But 1821 was a, bit, was a significant year. 1821, of course, Mexico declares its independence from Spain. 1821, there still is no authorized trade between the US and uh, New, and New Spain. There still is, um, there's still, it, Spain holds the control of trade until after Mexico declares its independence. So 1821, Missouri becomes a state. 1821, Mexican independence occurs. Um, but there's something else that's fueling that trade. And that is both markets in the Southwest and a complete collapse of the banking economy in Missouri in 1819. There had been enormous land speculation in Missouri, enormous movement of populations from Kentucky, from uh, the South into Missouri leading up to that. And in 1819, what finally brings it to a head is the fact that there is no that it's a land rich cash poor economy. And Santa Fe Trail, it's not that Becknell uh, is the first to travel there, but Becknell's timing is excellent. Becknell leaves the area around Franklin in 1821. Um, Becknell is a debtor. He owes about $500 to local creditors. There are a series of lawsuits involving Becknell and he takes um, he, he takes some mules and some neighbors and they head toward the Rocky Mountains hoping that they'll be able to bring back some cash. How did people know about that? Well there had been these earlier expeditions. There had been several ex expeditions to New Mexico and a very active trade. Um, with native peoples. So people knew that there was money available in Santa Fe. They knew in the Midwest that there were high furs and hides and mules and other livestock, which was in a sense, cash on the hoof. Um, so Missouri supplied the manufactured goods to New Mexican markets. They supplied, um, hardware. There's a wonderful piece in the Palace of the Governors, um, and it's the seal of the state of New Mexico that's made out of hardware. All of that hardware came from St. Louis. Um, so those are keys and locks and spoons and forks and knives, uh, latches, nails. I always loved looking at that. But now I live here in St. Louis where all of that was manufactured. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable to me. So Santa Fe became the nexus between the Camino Real to Mexico and the Santa Fe Trail. By about 1839, uh, Mexican traders, new Mexican traders dominated the trade. And another very interesting thing begins to happen after that period of time, and that's the way in which New Mexicans begin to associate with St. Louis. This is an 1841 J.C. Wild lithograph of, again, the, Santa, the, um, uh, the levee and the um, steamships that are along, steamboats, I keep saying steamships, steamboats that are along the Mississippi levee. And if you can read this document a little closer, it also gives us an idea of 
um, who is trading on the Santa Fe Trail. When we talk about the period between 1841 and 1846 in New Mexico, we talk about the Americans who came on the Santa Fe Trail. But it's a much more diverse lot than that. And if this, uh, if you can read this more closely, there are African American um, uh, haulers of goods on the Santa Fe Trail. There are native peoples who are along the river uh, who are also part of the trade. So I think um, sometimes what we don't preserve in written records, we, we do have in illustrations of the time. And I particularly like this one for understanding that dynamic of who's involved in the trade and in the trail. I've been researching the women who came across the Santa Fe Trail and many of us uh, in the lower left, you see the tombstone of Susan Shelby McGoffin and right here is an entry of, um, of, the, um, of the recording of her death. Susan Shelby McGoffin came to, Saint, to Santa Fe. She came through St. Louis very quickly through Jefferson Barracks and onto uh, Bent's Fort and uh, Fort Leaven, first Fort Leavenworth and then Bent's Fort on her way to Santa Fe in the summer of 1846 with the Army of the West. Her journal down the old Santa Fe Trail into Mexico used to be seen as the most important women's perspective on the Santa Fe Trail. That diary, in fact, was edited right here in the office where I'm sitting right now by, um, by Stella Drum. Stella Drum was the librarian for the Missouri Historical Society. And she received a copy of, she received Susan Shelby McGoffin's original diary. McGoffin traveled the Santa Fe Trail with the Army of the West. Her brother-in-law, James McGoffin, was um, the person who uh, negotiated the surrender of New Mexico to the Americans. She, tr she traveled with the Army of the West and without the, edita the, without the annotations and the editing that Stella Drum had done to place her journal in the context of the American takeover uh, of uh, the American annexation and takeover of the Southwest, I don't know that the journal would have been published, but it is, it's a fascinating piece. Um, I have been using Susan Shelby McGoffin's journal forever, and I find myself going back to it over and over and over again um, for her understanding, for her questioning of why Americans were traveling to, uh, to the West. The summer of 1846 and the Army of the West story is, of course, when the Santa Fe Trail changes from a, uh, from a route of commerce to a route of, of uh, conquest. And McGoffin's journal takes us sort of day by day. There are many, many journals written by men, many. Um, but McGoffin's is one of the few journals from the summer of 1846 that trace the perspective of women. I have been using Susan McGoffin's diary to look at the relationship that she had with her maid, uh, her enslaved maid, Jane. Um, and that has given me a very different perspective on the journal. Uh, I used to want to just sort of dismiss the journal as a little bit sweetly recording, but I've been reading it a lot deeper. And McGoffin gives us insight into the relationship between enlisted men and soldiers. She gives us insight into the relationship between, um, between a white woman of privilege and her African-American enslaved, uh, enslaved um, servant. So it's, I've spent a lot more time with that journal than I ever would have imagined. The woman dressed uh, in uh, native clothing on the upper left is uh, Adeline Carson, sometimes called Prairie Flower. She is the daughter of Kit Carson. And Kit Carson had brought Adeline uh, from Taos 
to St. Louis to live with his family, I'm, I'm sorry, to Missouri, to live with his family in Missouri um, after her mother died. Um, her mother was an, a Northern Arapaho woman. And after her death in 1837, Carson began to move Prairie Flower around. He takes her to Taos. She spends some time with the Bent family. And then in 1842, he decides to bring her to Missouri. It's often said she was brought to St. Louis. My research on her shows not that she was brought to St. Louis, but that she settled in Howard County, which is at the very beginning of the Overland route of the Santa Fe Trail, and that she settled with one of Kit Carson's sisters and went to school uh, in, um, um, in Glasgow, Missouri. But it's an amazing story, a deeper story of both the way in which women, Native women, uh, were part of the commerce of the trail in which the Metis, the children of mixed race, had so much trouble finding a place in frontier communities in Missouri. Although many of St. Louis itself had a fantastically rich um, multicultural heritage here, St. Louis contributed not Americans to the Santa Fe Trail, but Creoles, men and women who were from French and Native American uh, communities. So there's some fascinating parts of unpacking who started the Santa Fe Trail and to get away from the idea that they were Americans, they were French, they were German, they were Matisse, they were mixtures uh, of, of different peoples. The um, journal here on your right is actually the last will and testament of, um, of um, Antoine Robidoux. And Antoine Robidoux was part of a large French Canadian family from the area around Florissant, um, which is about 25 miles as the crow flies from St. Louis up the Missouri River. And the Robidoux family were principal dealers in trade, in uh, Indian trade goods and furs. They came from uh, Canada down the Missouri River into St. Louis and then moved from St. Louis to Florissant. The six Robidoux brothers traveled to New Mexico in the uh, 1820s and um, Antoine Robidoux married Carmel Benavides. Carmel Benavides was part of a family, the Baca family, who had the building that became 109 East Palace. And very early in their association in New Mexico, the Robidoux brothers married or took up with um, New Mexican women. And the Robidoux became very much a part of the elite, very much a part of the trading um, of the Santa Fe Trail. Robidoux stayed in New Mexico part of the time. It's not, I'm not quite sure how many crossings of the Santa Fe Trail uh, Carmel Benavides Robidoux made. I can trace her through about five different crossings. So after she married in 1829 in Santa Fe, she seems to have spent some time in Florissant. Then she went back to Santa Fe. She was certainly in Santa Fe in the summer of 1846 when Susan McGoffin entered, when the Army of the West entered. Then she goes back. Um, she comes back here to Missouri. Um, an earlier researcher, um, Mary Jean Cook, thought that she could trace her back and forth across the trail about six times. That may overestimate how much time she spent with Antoine and underestimate how much time um, that she and uh, Robidoux were together. So we can't trace her all the time. But a fascinating story of that mix of cultures that the Santa Fe Trail brought to us with people going back and forth across the trail. The census document of 1870 that's on the screen is another part of the story that I've been researching and that's African-American women on the trail. Um, Susan Shelby McGoffin took Jane across the trail, but many of the traders 
um, who crossed the trail had African American men and women with them, serving them in many domestic roles. This is the document I was using to trace Charlotte Green. Charlotte Green is at Bent's Fort in the summer of 1846. I'll tell you, if you wanted to be anywhere right in the center of where history was happening, it would have been to be at Bent's Fort in the summer of 1846 when the McGoffins were there, when, um, uh, when Kit Carson was there, and when, um, when uh, Charles Bent and his brothers were there. And the Bents brought with them an enslaved couple, Charlotte Green and her husband. Her husband was present at the Battle of Cienaguilla in New Mexico uh, during, the, during the American takeover. He was badly wounded in the, um, in the assault on Taos Pueblo. And in 1846, 1847, I can trace the Greens leaving Taos, coming back to Missouri, by tracing them through other people's journals about the, um, this, uh, about the uh, takeover of New Mexico. Charlotte Green was well known in the literature of the Santa Fe Trail, but you have to dig deep to find her. And she's there in various descriptions of dances, fandangos at Bent's Fort. She's there in the descriptions of um, She's there in the descriptions of, um, of a welcoming presence that she created at Bent's Fort. The last two women that I'm gonna talk about just for a minute that give us some deeper perspective on the trail are Francisca Lopez de Kimball. Francisca Lopez was the daughter of Demacio Lopez, uh, who, was a, who was a trader from Mexico. He actually came to Santa Fe, uh, to collect on a debt in the early 18, or, or probably the mid, uh, excuse me, the early 1840s. He has, then he takes up with a woman from New Mexico. They have children and his wife, his New Mexican wife dies in about 1850. By 1852, Damaso has decided that he needs to bring his children back to Missouri. And he brings them to Missouri because many of the Santa Fe Trail traders, both on the Missouri side and on the New Mexico side, use boarding schools in St. Louis, in Fayette, and in Independence, around Independence, to educate their children. Damaso Lopez leaves his three boys in Kansas City area to go to school, and he brings Francisca to the Visitation Academy here in St. Louis. Long story short, um, Francisca marries into a very prosperous family, the Kimball family. And um, you can trace through her letters, through documents documenting purchases that she made for her marriage, her, her, her complete transformation from a woman of New Mexican and Mexican culture to being very much part of, of an elite American family here in St. Louis. An amazing story, some touching documents, and I'm very grateful to her uh, family, Mary Uten and, um, and Mary's relatives who have allowed me to read some of her letters that show this transition. The other woman I wanna talk about is, um, is uh, Julia Archibald Holmes. Well, I read about Julia Archibald Holmes many years ago because she scandalized people traveling on the trail because she wore bloomers. And those bloomers are the least significant thing about her. Um, Julia Archibald Holmes and her husband are in New Mexico in the mid 1850s and they begin, Julia Archibald Holmes was a suffragist and she was also um, a woman who was very much um, an abolitionist. And when she came to New Mexico, she, fir she first came to the West to climb Pikes Peak with a group of abolitionists who are looking for a colony, place they could establish a colony. She and her husband end up in Taos, James. Then they moved to Santa Fe. And in Santa Fe, they, mount 
they create a printing press and a newspaper to take on the establishment in New Mexico. Um, they are here writing anti-slavery tracts when New Mexico for a short time adopts a, a very, um, a very opportunistic and ill-timed slave code. Um, and Julia Archibald Holmes is, is significant for way more than her bloomers, but that's what happens in history. We have relegated her to a minor role when she actually has a very major role. So following these women on the Santa Fe Trail, following their lives and their stories, give us a much deeper story than, um, than the story of just William Becknell. I'm always fascinated to find collection items that I knew in New Mexico and we have counterparts here in St. Louis and in New Mexico, this wonderful portrait of uh, Stephen Watts Carney as part of the Palace of the Governor's collection. The photograph on your right of the Rosenwald building and the Dice Apartments where it actually says bill billiards is in Las Vegas, New Mexico. And it was on the roof of the Dice Apartments where Stephen Watts Carney issued the act of possession claiming New Mexico and the West for, uh, for the United States. I have stood on that spot repeatedly in my career. I have stood under the gazebo on the Las Vegas Plaza reading Carney's instructions. Extremely important place. But when I was there a few weeks ago, I saw it in a very different light. This was a photo I took of the Dice Apartments a few weeks ago. And the man on the left is Antoine Robideau. That's a photo from the Palace of the Governor's uh, New Mexico History Museum collections. And when I say new friends in old places and old friends in new places, what I didn't know about Robideau till I moved here was his association with Stephen Watts Carney. Should have known it. But it was from that rooftop that Stephen Watts Carney's words were translated by Antoine Robideau. He translated those words of annexation in a community and then went out to Santa Fe where he also translated those words. And he was saying those words to his wife's family, to the family of Carmel Benavides Robideau. Robideau had been a an, um, mayor of St. Louis, he was married to New Mexican women, to a New Mexico woman. What was it like for her? What was it like for her family to hear Antoine Robideau say those words, claiming that Kearney would not take a pepper or an onion, would not harm anyone who was loyal to the United States? I can't imagine, I can't imagine. So there's another era that happens here, and that happens, of course, in 1875, uh, when the railroad starts to inch its way from St. Louis across the country. And I love this particular uh, newspaper advertisement, and it's um, advertising the um, St. Louis, Kansas City, and Northern Short Line Railroad as the safer and more efficient way to travel to the West, to travel to Santa Fe. Um, and there are women of leisure in their chairs uh, traveling across the country. Well, um, Flora Spiegelberg writes about taking that train from Raton to Santa Fe um, in 1879, 1880. And what she, or actually she took it from St. Louis to Raton, sorry. And then from Raton to Santa Fe, she took the train in 75. And what she talks about is being on the train and hearing people coughing and children crying and how uh, terribly uncomfortable it was. And it stands in such sharp contrast to some of the beautiful writing of traveling across the country on the Santa Fe Trail. Um, as hard as the condition were, conditions were, I made the the trip from Santa Fe, from St. Louis to Santa Fe by air, pretty much following the Santa Fe Trail to Albuquerque, and then drove up to Santa Fe. I traveled about 1,077 miles a few weeks ago, just in 10 hours on a trip that would have probably taken 100 days in the 1850s. Um, 
but I think we lost some things by traveling by train. And I've been very interested in this commemoration of the Santa Fe Trail across the country. Probably one of my favorite things has been listening to Trucker, Trucker Radio USA. I know you all have that dialed in on your phones, but Trucker Radio USA has actually been doing a very interesting history of the Santa Fe Trail uh, with a musical score to it by uh, Michael Martin Murphy. Uh, we've been observing Santa Fe Trail commemorations on the Santa Fe Plaza in Arrow Rock, where those pictures are taken. I stopped in Gardner, Kansas to take a picture right across from a Santa Fe Trail marker of a truck depot also using these same trails. One of the places that I love in Santa Fe to go to is uh, the area around Santa Plaza to see right by Prince Plaza, this wonderful archeological exhibit that really is the best illustration I've ever seen of the material culture change that the Santa Fe Trail brought to New Mexico. There's so much history on the trail, so much deeper than just that moment of, um, of uh, um, William Becknell entering the Santa Fe Plaza. And I've kind of become a one woman campaign for rethinking how we teach American history. And I believe if we taught American history from the perspective of the Santa Fe Trail, it would be a much deeper story, deeper than the ruts, deeper than the pillars that have been erected along the trail. It would really allow us to see what happens when people of different cultures meet, what happens as we cross the country and bring people of tribal, and French and German, American and, um, and Hispanic backgrounds together. So I think when we look at commemorating and reflecting on the Santa Fe Trail, it's a huge history, it's a powerful history. And I think, I usually don't like anniversary commemorations, but I'm very excited about uh, the Santa Fe Trail because I think it lends such a different perspective on American history. Thank you so much to the uh, Historic Santa Fe Foundation for inviting me to speak with you today. And Melanie, I think I hit my time mark. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, I, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about the upcoming book. You've done so much research um, on these women and their journals and how they actually contributed along the way. And I think that that probably um, has not been um, researched as in depth as you have done it. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm very impressed. Um, if anyone wants to post any questions, there are a couple of people who raised their hands and I apologize, but we don't um, open up the video and the audio. Uh, Susanna Howard just raised her hand. If you would post questions in the chat or the Q&A, uh, and then I'll be happy to read those out. I did announce that at the beginning, but some of you may have missed that if you joined a little bit later. So there's one question that popped up. I do have some too, just in case, but Oliver Horn says, um, uh, have you encountered anything about James L. Johnson in your work? The gentleman who uh, owned the El Zaguan building where we are. I have not, but I will, uh, if you provide me with a few uh, biographical details about him, I'll get our researchers on it. We have oh. an amazing archive here and oh. archivists. And so if you can send me some things about James Johnson uh, and Oliver, I hate to tell you this, but I didn't do that much research based on men. They're in there because they were present too, but most of my research really focused on the women on the trail. Okay, well, and I, I, I can get you some of that information. Oliver does have some of it probably handy. He's working on some of the interpretation with us for El Zaguan when we convert it to more of a museum space. And I bet some of the trees that were planted around El Zaguan came from rootstock provided from Missouri. So um, if you can get me some of that information. One of the things I didn't mention was Josiah Gregg, as he traveled the Santa Fe Trail, sent botanical specimens from um, Mora and also from, um, uh, it could have been Sapeyo, but I know from Mora and a couple of other places on the Santa Fe Trail here to the herbarium 
at the botanical gardens. Oh, okay. Fantastic. There you go. Well, Oliver says, thank you. Um, you uh, did I miss something about the steamship Arabia? Did you say it, it actually sank, but then they discovered it on land? It's, yes, it's an incredible story. And you can visit steamship Arabia in Kansas City and you should, because it's a phenomenal story. It sank on this um, bend of the river. And as I say, I've forgotten the name of it. It was in my slide, but I couldn't see my own notes on it. Um, but there is the Steamship Arabia Museum and the river, the Missouri River shifted course. And so what had been a bend in the river became dry land. And um, some uh, salvage operators uncovered part of the, I think it was part of the flue or part of the masting in the cornfield. And then that was known for a long time, but in 1988, they started um, excavating that steamship. And if you wonder ever what actually came across the Santa Fe Trail, the Steamship Arabia is the most remarkable collection of materials. So yes, it was excavated on dry land, obviously sank in deep in water. Uh, and all of it is now on display. Part of the boat is on uh, is in the museum, but mostly the uh, the goods. Oh, okay, fantastic. Very cool. And where is the where is it located? In is Kansas it... City. Okay, all right. Okay, good. We do have another... out of Kansas City. <laughs> we do have another question. How robust was trade between Santa Fe and Mexico in 1821? How much of the trade drive was specifically driven by Mexican goods? Oh. Uh, I think the trade was very much driven by Mexican goods as well. Um, you know, one of the most important things that came back from uh, New Mexico to Missouri was silver. And uh, that's what they did not have in Missouri was actual cash, actual cash basis or silver basis of an economy. So um, what, what came back were pieces of eight were Mexican reales were one of the principal uh, trade items. Now the material goods from Mexico, um, not as significant. What was very significant in the trade were the hides, the furs, the pelts, um, and uh, not, not very many goods in and of themselves. The goods mostly went from the American side to the New Mexican side. Okay, you know my questions right now. I may have um, a couple more, and you may have answered this, and I apologize if I should already know it. But why was um, was it was it because Missouri became a state and then Mexico gained independence um, as to the reason why Becknell came in at that time, and then why was it Becknell? Why was well, he actually recognized as the first? Because uh, I think it was. A sort of apocryphal story. He was uh, he was uh, he was absolutely not the first. There were several traders who came before, but he was the right man in the right place at the right time. He was discovered quite by accident at the Puerto Cito de la Piedra Lumbre, which is um, east, uh, which is west of Las Vegas, and he was met by uh, by uh, Pedro Ignacio Gallego who led a group of, um, of New Mexico militia out. They were actually looking for uh, a group of native peoples who had been um, raiding on the area around um, San Miguel del Vado. So other traders had come into the upper uh, Arkansas River Valley in Southern Colorado for quite a while, had come down and traded at at Taos, but when Becknell was discovered by Gallego, first he took him to um, San Miguel del Vado, and then they took him to the palace of the governors to meet Facundo Melgares, who was governor. Melgares had just recently, it was around the 1st of November of 18, um, 21, and Melgares had himself just received the information 
that Mexico declared its independence from Spain had won its independence. Melgares was a very fascinating governor, a very interesting period of time in New Mexico history. Melgares had also intercepted Zebulon Pike in 1807 and mm -hmm. had accompanied Pike when he made his uh, arrest march from Santa Fe to Mexico City. Melgares knew quite a bit about the Eastern um, half of the United States. Malgares spoke French. That's how he and, and Becknell communicated. And so Malgares uh, was the last sort of royalist governor of New Mexico, but his, uh, his knowledge of, of Americans, his knowledge of the frontier. So Missouri was the East, was the Western frontier of the United States. Santa Fe was the Northern frontier of Mexico. And so they fed that exploration to each other. But Becknell is mentioned, is remembered as the first because he's really the first one to enter New Mexico after New Mexico declares its independence from Spain. But very quickly thereafter, there are a couple of other expeditions that enter New Mexico as well. Oh, thanks. That was a, that was a fantastic in-depth answer. That was fantastic. Maybe uh, one more question. Maybe one more here, and then we'll see if we have one more after that. But other than that, I think we'll wrap up sometime soon. But um, uh, Richard Polisi says, uh, "Tell us about the Cimarron Cutoff. A few details." I think maybe he also wants to know maybe where it is too. <laughs> you no, know, uh, I'd have to go back to the map. I have to tell you, Richard, you're going to hate this answer because I have focused so little on what's on the ground because I've been so focused on the women's diaries. I have been so focused on finding women um, in the documents that I have not spent as much time documenting it on the ground, but I plan to. I plan to drive the Santa Fe Trail several times when I'm, when I'm able. Yeah, maybe that's a good uh, historic Santa Fe Foundation tour. <laughs> oh, you should come. We'll meet you in Kansas City and guide you from Kansas City back to St. Louis. We hosted the Santa Fe Trail Association in St. Louis two years ago, and everyone who came on it was just completely amazed by the materials that are here in the Botanical Garden records, in the Art Museum records, and in the History Museum records. So we would love to host you here. Okay. We'll and we'll help you set up great places all along the way. Okay, good. We'll keep that one in mind. And I have one more question. Uh, I, I have a lots of questions to you probably on my list, but let's go with Carla McConnell's uh, question of, does your research include Mary Donahoe, who is said to have arrived in Santa Fe in 1832? Yeah, you know, Mary Donahoe is um, is kind of a footnote. She's She's in there, but not as much. And I didn't attempt to find all women on the Santa Fe Trail. I was really focused on women who I could document in and through St. Louis and Santa Fe. So Mary Donahoe is there. I certainly talk about Mary Donahoe uh, because of the perspective that it gives us on uh, the Mexican period. So she's, she's in the book, but she wasn't a principal focus. Okay. And Richard follows up with um, Cimarron cut, Cutoff made the Santa Fe Trail shorter and quicker, but it was more dangerous from native attacks. Right. Um, uh, uh, and then another comment, one can take the train from KC and from there get a different train to St. Louis. So they're providing details to make their way to see you. <laughs> um, oh, are they? Well, let's yeah, have a party. The yeah, there we go. Let's have a party. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, I... Um, I mean, I, I do have more questions along the way too, but I think we're going to end up wrapping it up because what I thought found was really interesting too, how you um, addressed the the slave population. And then you talk a little bit about the slave code um, with the Julia, when Julia Archibald Holmes was here too. I, I found all that incredibly interesting too. And I like how you're digging into, um, you, can, you can't touch on every single thing that's out there, but... Yeah, you're digging into a lot of information and you're getting a lot of thank yous for such a great presentation. And I also wanna thank you very much for taking this on, especially considering it's the anniversary and doing it remotely. And we miss you here, having you here oh, in Saturday too. 
thank you so much. Um, boy, Edward Lopez asked me who is the most remarkable woman and it's the first book <laughs> yeah. who I started with and that was uh, uh, Maria Rosa Villalpando Sale Dit Le Joie. And that name tells you everything about her transition from being a captive to a Creole. You're gonna have to just have me back to talk about yeah, that. I know, exactly, yeah, because I wanna dig into that. I have about five more questions, I think, myself, but. Well, invite me back. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks, Fran. Thanks. Thank Dr. you Rupi. so much. Yeah, and thank Bye. you all for joining us. Um, and if anyone has any questions, just, you know, you're welcome to email me. I think everyone has the email too. Thank you so much. Yeah, and have a nice, have a nice continuation of holidays and the whole holiday season and New Year's. If Thank you, Melanie. It's great to see you in uh, in this context. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.